Um, we have uh, this morning uh, Emmanuel and uh, Enrique and Theodore are going to all together uh, tell us about learning staircases. And I think Emmanuel uh, will start from Luzon, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I don't see you, but uh, uh, I, I suspect that uh, uh, it's good to be physically uh, meeting. I hopefully will make it to the next one. But at least we have Theo and Enric that are going to pick up and take over the talk soon. So yes, so uh, this is the topic. And, you know, the first the question is the same as we had in the previous uh, talks of this collaboration. We want to understand what in the setting of, of deep learning, of combining over parameterized nets with GD, what is the uh, sufficient and necessary, meaning how sufficient is the framework? Is it, you know, back? Is it less? What is the class of uh, architecture and functions that work well together? And also, is it necessary to go to this framework or could we get away with kernels and what is necessary in the framework? Okay, so these questions, it seems like you know, to answer them, it matters what is the class of neural net architectures and initialization that we allow. Uh, and this spectrum is kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the range of complexities we can have at the very left here. You see my mouse moving? Yeah. Uh, so at the very left here, uh, you know, it's like the most structured and regular uh, architecture, you know, fully connected, two layer uh, with IID initialization. And then, you know, as you evolve, you get the, through, you know, more uh, practical uh, architecture. And at the very uh, right extreme, this is what I, I refer to free networks with just, you know, anything you want in your architecture, as long as it has polynomial number of uh, edges. And, you know, you can also initialize as you want. So, in, you know, in the past years with a few uh, uh, collaborators, we looked at the right extreme. And this is kind of the summary uh, of the picture in this right extreme. So in in the world where all the uh, parameters that you care about scale polynomially, so I won't define things more precisely because I want to move on to the, the new stuff. But in this world, when you train neural networks that are free with SGD, it turns out that you can get everything that's efficiently pack learnable, but that is efficiently learnable from uh, polymany samples. If you insist on using full, full population gradients with some a noise uh, uh, that is polynomial, then you will saturate um, at SQL. And you know, in this recent paper with Natty and others, we got the in-between picture as well, which is, I mean, we don't have the full picture, but the fairly tight uh, characterization of what you can get if you have a, a batch size B and some precision noise on your gradients. And there's some sort of threshold phenomena that you either get to pack or SQL, okay? And we also know that this is strictly better than what you can do with kernels. So that's the picture in the free world. And you know uh, the fact that the answer to yes, SGD with free nets can get back is, you know, it's nice to know. It lets you, it allows you to dream because the answer is yes, but the actual solution of how we get there doesn't seem to explain much about how real neural networks are, are learning. And what's missing in this picture is that, you know, in many applications, the neural nets don't try to do what we do in those papers, which is, you know, emulate other algorithms, but they actually manage to learn features hierarchically from an initialization that is fairly a uh, black box that doesn't, you know, encode too much about the problem at hand. Of course, you know, this statement is, is hard to quantify because A, if you look at what really Google uses, it's pretty far from a two layer fully connected. And B, you know, it's still very quite specific application images, et cetera. But still, if you look at regular nets with, you know, homogeneous layer, IID stuff, it still learns a fair amount of functions and not in a way by emulating certain algorithm. Okay, so we want to understand this hierarchical aspect that is missing in the picture of the previous slide. And, and so let's move to the extreme left uh, uh, of the spectrum of complexities and, and look at these uh, regular networks or initialization. So we will, you know, we will define what we mean by uh, uh, what the type of nets we use in the theorems. But for now, I will stay fairly high level. By regular, I mean that you know you put edges between a certain number of layers in an independent fashion uh, across uh, uh, between any pair of layers. You also put edges that could be long edges from the input to the middle in the in an uh, independent IID fashion, and also from the middle to the output if you want. But all of this must be done with some probabilities for each type of edge, which is, you know, IID. 
And it, you put the weights on these edges also from an IID distribution. So in particular, at each layer, if you apply a permutation of the neurons at initialization, you must have the same distribution. Okay, so again, uh, a bit more on the setup, uh, we will care about Boolean function. Um, we denote uh, the D to be the input dimension. Uh, calligraphic F is typically the class of function, uh, the hypothesis class we want to learn. We get samples where the input is uniform on the Boolean cube and uh, we'll train uh, uh, in most results, we use the L2 loss. Again, the parameters we use is a little n for the number of samples and capital N for the width of the net or for the number of features. Now, once you have a Boolean function, uh, uh, we know that you can decompose any such Boolean function into its Fourier basis, which es essentially means that you can decompose such function in terms of the monomials, which are here, the chi s, uh, the monomials that look at the variables in a subset s, and the f out of s will be the Fourier coefficient. Okay, so we want to understand what kind of Boolean function or Boolean function class we can learn um, from such regular type of architectures. And, uh, you know, what we started with is uh, what many people also uh, looked at is what happens when you look at a single basis element, which is, you know, you want to see uh, this chi s, uh, when is it that we can learn them? So, you know, we know that uh, if the power of your monomial is large, we know that from SQ or from the stuff we had in the, in the universal setting that we get into trouble if you have population gradient or huge uh, batch. But uh, uh, now we are asking a slightly different questions because uh, uh, we are not allowed to, uh, to do some kind of uh, emulation. So we cannot do the university result because we are forced to use a regular net. So let's just do some experiment with uh, a ResNet uh, with five layers, uh, width is 40. Um, and we use SGD with you know, a moderate size uh, for the batch. And we can see that, uh, of course, as expected, if capital P, the power of the monomial is one, so the function is just linear, it learns pretty quickly. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, it's a fairly easy function to learn, but uh, as P increases quite soon uh, for 10 already, uh, uh, it gets nothing, uh, you know, after even 100,000 uh, iteration of SGD. Uh, okay, so uh, it seems like if you stick to this basis element uh, pretty quickly, as the power becomes, you know, not uh, small, uh, already such fairly big neural net uh, get into trouble. Okay, so is this then uh, what's happening if you go beyond monomials? If you now take mixture of monomials, which is, you know, what happens in more general Boolean functions, you know, is it uh, that the answer is simply that you can only learn polynomials that are finite degree, that have low degree? And, um, and the first, uh, you know, remark is that this is, uh, of course, not true. And here is a simple case where uh, you can go to high degree and still learn. And this is what we call the vanilla stir case, where you get to a high degree term here. So the P here could be as large as you want. Uh, but, you know, you get there in a very specific form, which is that you have a hierarchy of coefficients that are nested into each other. So the key here is that the low degree terms are helping the high degree terms. If you try to learn these with a neural net, you, it will probably pick up the dominant term, which is the linear term x1. And once it has x1, you know, if you look at the next term, if you factor out x1, then it's again a linear term. And if you factor out x1, x2 in the third term, then it's again, you know, just a linear term, which is you add x3. So it looks like this could be uh, uh, useful uh, uh, to learn for you know, regular nets. And in fact, if you do this experiment, uh, you see that this happens, that you can learn a staircase of degree 10. So recall that before, just the last um, uh, coefficient would not be learned uh, at all. This is this plot here on the right. But now if you work with the staircase, then you will learn the whole staircase and you can learn the last term uh, uh, with perfect accuracy. And on top of this, it's the, the way that those free coefficients are learned is done hierarchically in the sense that you first start learning as expected the linear terms, then the quadratic, and you, know, you pick up uh, uh, each higher degree uh, successively as the number of iteration goes up. Okay, so what the next question that we wondered at this point was like, okay, is this class of staircase function? So I mean the class because you can take a, per, a permutation of you know, all the functions obtained by uh, applying permutation on the input. So you can do x7 plus x7, x9, et cetera. 
And is this just, you know, an instance of an efficiently SQ learnable function class? And is this what we are going after with, with this approach that maybe we're trying to argue that with regular nets, we will also be able to get any S in, in SQ? Um, and so uh, to see why this is not the case, consider the following truncated staircase where you start with a monomial of degree J as opposed to degree one, and you climb to a monomial of degree K. Okay, so they are nested, but you go from degree J to K. And what happens is that as long as you don't break the steps, either at the beginning or the end, so at least if either at the beginning or the end, uh, you can uh, uh, go on the staircase, so you can either climbing, uh, climb it or you can go down the staircase, then this will be SQ uh, learnable. And the reason for that is that you know, if you know that you go all the way up, so let's say that you, you, you know the staircase uh, ends uh, or almost ends, you can pull out a few constant terms, but almost ends uh, at the full monomial, then you can still learn it with SQ because you know the full monomial is there. And so now you can say, okay, I'm going to try to learn which one is the next monomial that is nested into this one. There's only uh, D uh, potential monomials to drop one element. So you can check for all these D monomials and figure out which one is there with an SQ query. And then you can peel out this guy and go down the staircase. Hello? Yes. yes. Can you clarify a bit what you mean by SQ learnable? Because this is a specific function. Do you mean like a function class through the permutations yeah. or? Yeah, no, no. That's what I meant with the permutation command. So if you if you apply permutation on, uh, so if instead of uh, this, the function was x7 plus x7, x8 plus x7, x8, x9. So all the class of functions that have the property that you know, it's a nested chain of coefficients. This creates a, a class of function that we call the staircase class, okay. or the vanilla staircase class. Okay. Thanks. So, the, so you're saying the class of functions are this form for any permutation, right? Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And what I meant is, as long as either at the beginning or at the end you're you you do not have a jump, you start with degree one or you start with maximal degree. You could still, in both cases, you could still learn with SQ because you know that you can start either at the beginning or at the end, and you can either climb by figure out with SQ queries which of the degree degree one monomial you have. If you go up, and if you go down, you just figure out which of the the of the monomial you have to drop. And uh, in both cases, uh, this would be SQ learnable, uh, and 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 it doesn't uh, require you to climb up the staircase or go down. It's, it's learnable with SQ, but the point is that this is not learnable if you want to learn it with a regular net. Uh, and the problem is that the regular net, what it has as an input are the degree one monomial. So if you feed x1, x2, x3 uh, as input to your neural net and it's regular, then you will not know how to go down. And so you need uh, any staircase that uh, has the beginning of the first steps that are broken the neural net with SGD will have trouble uh, finding a path to go up the staircase. And now in some cases, we can argue that. So that's not the part of this talk, but this is just to say, okay, so this class of function uh, is not something that uh, what you can learn with a regular net doesn't seem to be the entire SQL class because of this. The next question is, you know, are we now overshooting? Is the class of staircase only what you can do with kernels? Uh, many, meaning that maybe now we have actually a pretty simple class of function. And the answer is also no, that you know, if you have staircases that have a growing degree, these are not kernel learnable, but they will be actually learnable by regular net as we will uh, discuss in this talk. Um, so what is the, the, I'm gonna now tell you a bit about uh, this part of why staircases of growing deg degree are not kernel learnable. And first of all, we know already that uh, this would be the case for certain kernels like NTKs or for random features models. Uh, and the reason for that is that any such function, not necessarily staircase, we know that they require number of samples or minimum of samples and number of features to scale uh, uh, polynomially with uh, uh, D to the power K where K is the degree. And uh, so if K grows, then of course you will need super polynomial number of samples or, or features. And, and that's why you will be in trouble for these specific models. Now, the question we ask is also, can we have a more general result that shows that no matter what your kernel is, you know, even if you try to be smart and you know that it's a, you know that the function class is staircase, so you can maybe say, okay, I'm going to put all my degree one monomial, and then I'm going to sparsify the degree K with some proper sparsification, et cetera. So could we argue that no matter what is the number of features we use, N, capital N, that is polynomial, we will always be in trouble to learn a staircase of growing degree. 
And the reason why this is not completely obvious is because, uh, at least to our knowledge, that the tools that are available in literature that goes with statistical dimension argument, they typically look like this. So here I'm quoting uh, from the, the paper of Nati and Cotter. Uh, uh, you lower bound the uh, min max loss uh, by the trivial uh, loss. So we are normalizing all the functions to have norm one. Uh, minus something that depends on the number of features and the static statistical dimension of the class, uh, which for classes like staircases will be polynomial because you can, uh, you can learn these uh, with SQ. And so if this is uh, down, if the, the, the denominator is polynomial, in theory, you could take a large number of polynomial feature and not make this bound you know, uh, uh, going to one. Uh, so how do we get around this is, uh, is a simple trick we, we, is the following lemma. Uh, we will decompose the set of all Boolean function into the direct sum of the Boolean function that have degree less than C and the Boolean function that have degree at least C. And then we just lower bound the contribution of the loss of the optimal loss into these two edges. This is the edge you get when you look at all features of degree at most C and you don't care that we only are supposed to use N. Here we can afford taking all of them because we will take C small enough. And now we have this kind of uh, edge here that looks only at features. Now we have capital N of them, but these are features that, are, that must have degree at least C. And uh, what's beneficial is that if you apply this type of bound on this uh, projected problem, when you must have a certain degree, then you can actually get this time a bound that uh, is vanishing uh, as long as N is polynomial. So I... I I, I can, okay, I, I give a, a little bit more details, but not much, but essentially, so you look at this class of staircase function normalized to have norm one uh, of degree P and, um, and you pick a cutoff, which is root P for this degree. And this makes that the first contribution, the blue one uh, of all features that can have degree at most C is going to be vanishing because C is growing. So, you know, there's no way that uh, um, is growing slowly. So this is going to be, uh, not enough uh, uh, to capture the fact that the, uh, you have root P for the degree when the true staircase goes all the way up to P. And now you pull out the N on the second contribution. Uh, and the good news is that this term, which is kind of playing the role of you know, what you have in, 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 in this original bounds, but in the projected space, this term is going to be also vanishing because you, know, you only have, uh, you can still have a lot of terms that are below root P that you're ignoring. And so, you know, you can control both terms and, and that's how you show that, oops, sorry. And that's how you can show that no matter how the kernel you, you use, as long as the staircase has growing degree, you cannot learn it uh, if you have n polynomial. Okay, so this is just to say we are doing more than kernels with these staircase functions. And now the question that remains is, can we actually learn them? You know, we know that uh, uh, you can, uh, you can, they are not SQL, they are more than kernels, but you know, We'd like to understand if we can learn them with regular nets. And, um, and in the first paper we have, uh, uh, which is with uh, uh, this co-author, you know, is presented now at NeurIPS, um, uh, what we show is the following. So we generalize a little bit this class of function. This is, you know, the very, very, the doubly vanilla staircase, but the more generally what we call the vanilla staircase is the, any function with polymany uh, terms of polynomial magnitude for the coefficients such that any non-zero free coefficient contains another non-zero free coefficient of one degree less or is an input. So it could be what I wrote there or any permutation of that, or it could be a staircase which has multiple branches that leave, you know, like for example, X1, you can go a path that goes X1, X2, et cetera, but you can go another path that goes X1, X3 and take another branch. So as long as you have this vanilla staircase property, what we can show is that Gradient-based learning on a regular net, but that I will um, mention a little bit more uh, in, in 30 seconds what this, this uh, net we use, can learn these vanilla staircases in poly time. So that's the positive results. It's, it's a regular net, but it's still not, you know, uh, uh, I as a regular as uh, uh, what we will discuss in the next part of the talk. It's, it's a sparse net where, you know, we put edges uh, we, we put a lot of width, the, the depth is D, is P, is the, is the degree of the, the staircase, but we make enough width and we make the net sparse enough such that we kind of a little bit give hand to the SGD algorithm by making sure that, you know, each uh, uh, neuron has at most uh, uh, two uh, 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 parents. And so we kind of give a bit a hand uh, 
to the analysis so that it makes it easier to each time recursively learn the product of the previous term with the new input. So it's still uh, regular in the sense that it satisfies all these permutation invariants and that break the emulation argument we have in the, in the, in the other papers, but it's still not fully uh, um, uh, seeing how the features being, be, are being built, for example, in a, in a dense uh, regular uh, net like a two layer uh, uh, min field net, etc. So this is, a, yes? <laughs> A question. Uh, so what does it mean here in this theorem gradient based learning yeah so that's the second part yeah so i was about to say uh, the it's also not a standard uh, uh, hgd what it means is that we do we train each layer it's layer wise sgd but also we train a, a neuron repeatedly to uh, mitigate error propagations that we have uh, a training so it's still you know not the classical sgd where you know you just train uh, it's it's gradient based but it's not you know uh, ideally the the sgd would like to analyze Emmanuel, think, it's it's neuron wise training uh it's it's uh, it's uh, you train each neurons in a, in a layer each sequentially so each neuron separately yeah. right yeah so it's like neuron wise yeah. right so anyway, that's the, the end of my part. And I, I think um, the point we want to make is uh, we exactly want to go uh, beyond this theorem. And that's what uh, Enrique and Theo will present. Uh, you know, we don't want to, you know, we, we had something that was regular, but still a little bit uh, hacky once we allowed us to be regular. And now we want to switch to, you know, more standards type of neural nets, uh, uh, denser, and also classical SGD analysis. And also we don't want to be anymore in the poly time lens, but we want to go to how things scale exactly with number of samples and time steps. So that's the, the end of the, the, the first part. And I guess, Theo, you will take over. Thanks, Emilio. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. We can leave this thing. Yeah. Right, so with uh, Enrique, I uh, will consider a more restricted setting. And uh, we'll consider a staircase uh, with bounded degrees. And uh, OK, so actually, we'll take a step back and we'll consider like a slightly more general setting in this bounded setting, which is uh, learning sparse functions on the hypercube. Uh, so we'll take uh, so data x uniformly distributed on the hypercube in d dimension. And we'll consider y to be noisy measurement of a target function f star. And so we'll assume that f star is uh, p sparse. Uh, so that means that there exists i1 to ip, so indices, so unknown, so that uh, f star only depends on this uh, subset of coordinates. And in this section, we'll consider p uh, to be bounded and d uh, large enough. So why uh, is this setting interesting? So for linear models, uh, so that uh, such as random features and kernel methods, so they are oblivious to sparsity and are only adaptive to the smoothness of the target function. So let me uh, give a concrete example. So to learn a degree k polynomial on the hypercube, uh, so random features and inner product kernels will need the number of random features n and number of sample uh, small n that scales with d at the power k. And so no matter the structure of the polynomial. Uh, so for example, if it's sparse or non-sparse, it will still need uh, to scale with d at the power k. So on the other hand, uh, we expect no networks to be able to adapt to sparsity and to uh, sometimes uh, like uh, vastly outperform uh, this uh, linear uh, methods. Uh, so this is clear from a, an approximation uh, point of view. But actually proving that uh, for gradient-based, uh, like gradient-trained neural networks, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. And there is uh, almost no work doing that. So OK, so we consider a p-sparse degree k target function f star on the hypercube. So just note that uh, because we're on the hypercube, a p-sparse function is at most degree p. Um, and so we'll ask two questions. So the first one, like, um, uh, inspired by this linear methods. So can we show that for some S star, vanilla GD, SGD trained neural networks can learn with uh, number of neurons big N and number of samples uh, small N 
that scales as d at the power c with c much smaller than k and g. And this will, uh, this will Im immediately imply a separation result between uh, kernel methods, linear models, and uh, gradient train neural networks. And again, there's like only a few examples uh, that show that. So second question, so more interesting. So what properties on Esther allows for efficient learning with uh, GDSGD? Uh, okay. So here, what do I mean by vanilla GDSGD trained neural networks? Uh, so we take uh, the simplest neural network, so like, uh, which is like the two layer neural network with uh, so big N neurons. Uh, so parameters theta i, so a i, a scalar w i, a vector in R d. Uh, so w i, first layer weight, uh, a i, second layer weight. And just notice that here I normalize by one over n. So this is the mean field normalization. And so we consider a test error with square loss and we'll run SGD on both layers. So nothing more, no black box, no dark magic. And so here, SGD will be, okay, so we initialize with uh, ID weights, uh, with initialized, uh, like initial distribution row zero. And so I teach step K, we sample XK, YK, and so update the weights. Uh, so eta here will denote the step size and will denote theta K, the weights uh, like obtained after K iterations of uh, this SGD. And so this is uh, like quite challenging to study directly. So we'll use an approximation, mean field approximation. And so what we'll assume is that uh, we use new fresh samples at each iteration. So the XK, YK are ID. So we're doing a one pass SGD. So this is like the important uh, assumption here for like this mean field approximation to work. Uh, so we can like, uh, change the learning rates. We can uh, uh, do batch SGD. The Im like, uh, important thing is that at each iteration, we use new fresh samples. So with this assumption, so cell groups in 2018 showed uh, that the empirical distribution of the weights uh, theta i obtained after uh, t over eta uh, SGD steps so they uh, like uh, this empirical distribution converges weakly to rho t. So distribution on the space of parameters, so d plus one dimensional. And so it converges as the number of neurons n goes to infinity and uh, the step size goes to zero. And uh, this rho t is given by, um, so the evolution of rho t is given by this distributional dynamics so with initialization, so row zero and uh, TSPD, and just note that the neural network now is you know, just uh, integral over uh, the deep distribution of Ruthie. Okay. So how well does uh, this mean field approximation uh, fare? Uh, so we'll do a few assumptions. So we'll assume that the response and the noise are bounded. Uh, that the activation function is twice uh, differentiable. And uh, we'll assume that uh, sigma, sigma prime, and sigma prime prime are all uh, bounded. And uh, we'll assume that uh, the initialization row zero has uh, bounded support on A. And uh, so from a previous paper with Song and Andrea, we proved the following bound. So the null network trained by uh, SGD, uh, is a close in L2 distance to the neural network trained by mean field PDE up to time t, so it's bounded by like this formula. And so the only thing to notice is that, so k only depends on the assumptions above assumptions. And so in particular, it will be independent of d and p. So just another remark about this bound. So for t and k, so if you consider them constant, so the mean field approximation is accurate uh, as long as the number of neurons is bigger than a constant and the self size is smaller than one over D. And just note that uh, because we have this one pass assumption, the number of samples is just T over uh, eta. And so like the number of samples just needs to be uh, bigger than D, a constant than D. 
okay? Uh, so, so far I didn't use anything about F star. So now uh, we can just look at what happens when F star is uh, sparse, P sparse. So we take uh, X, the uh, so covariate. Uh, so we uh, uh, decompose it in uh, Z part, which is the signal part, P dimensional, uh, and R, which is the non-informative part of the input. Uh, we take uh, the weights also, we decompose it in U and V, so U align with the uh, signal part and V align with the non-informative part of the input. Uh, so if we take uh, initialization uh, A0, W0 with W0 uh, uniform on the hypercube, um, then the PDE's permutation variant in the last D minus P coordinates, in particular the weights uh, of the neural network uh, that are aligned with the non-informative part of the signal will just uh, be rescaled, uh, but will just uh, evolve regularly with uh, coefficient st. Yes. Yeah, row a is just the initial initial uh, uh, like uh, uh, distribution for a. So just uh, uh, a and w are initialized uh, independently on both layers, and just assume that a zero is distributed with row a and row a. Like so far, we don't assume anything. Oh yeah, like yeah, it's confusing. I guess yeah, a is not a time parameter. Um, yes. So b t p minus p coordinate. How comes permutation invariant implies that it just evolves basically? Oh, you just show it. Oh, it's just because uh, so x uh, so like r will also be uh, uh, so you can uh, um, yeah so you can uh, absorb v zero in uh, r which is also uniform on the hypercube. So this is actually not uh, very important here. So you can like uh, take a more general uh, like distribution. Uh, Initial distribution, if it's isotropic, it will also work. Uh, I mean, it won't be uh, uh, like you won't have like this nice rescaling of uh, VT. But uh, like what I will say next will also work. So the point is uh, here is just to give a concrete example how it can work. So here uh, we have, uh, we can uh, then write the equivalent dynamics. So instead of being D plus one dimensional, it's P plus two dimensional. So now the parameters are a0, u0, and s0. So u0 is like the p-dimensional uh, uh, weights uh, aligned with the signal. And so s0 is initialized with equal to one. a0 has a same initialization as before and u0 also too. And uh, so here we have like this equation. So I won't go into the details. Uh, and I just mentioned that now the neural networks only depend on uh, Z, also the signal part. And uh, here, um, I take D goes to infinity in these uh, equations. So what happened is that U0 is a p-dimensional vector uh, with entries that are plus minus one over square root of D. Uh, so when D goes to infinity, you can approximate U0 by just a zero vector. Uh, ST evolves at a rate T over square root of D. I mean, st minus one is bounded by t over square root of d. So for finite time, uh, when d goes to infinity, you can uh, assume st constant, so equal to one. And so if you look at, for example, this, so s equal one, and now you take the expectation over r. So like uh, it's just uh, you have a, a sum of Rademacher uh, divided by square root of d, and so this is uh, just uh, uh, converges to a Gaussian, and so we. Uh, introduced this sigma bar, which is a smooth activation with this uh, Gaussian. And so what we uh, get at the end, so when D goes to infinity, we get this, uh, what I call the dimension-free uh, dynamics. Uh, so dimension-free is because like this uh, PD doesn't depend on D anymore. Uh, so we have A0 distributed as before, U0 that uh, has like zero initialization. Uh, and uh, we have these equations. And now we have a neural network with uh, p-dimensional input z and a smoothed activation uh, sigma bar. And uh, just uh, so what did we do? 
uh, we started from this MFPD, uh, which is a gradient flow on the space of um, neural networks uh, with D plus one parameters uh, with this initialization. And when uh, D goes to infinity, replaced it by this equivalent gradient flow uh, on P plus one dimension and uh, with initialization. So first uh, layer weights uh, equal to zero. And the difference between the two dynamics up to time t is bounded by this quantity. And so if we merge the two previous bounds, oh yeah. Oh, it's uh, when d goes to infinity. Uh, so uh, here, what I did. So here, like, uh, so yeah, I took uh, d goes to infinity. What's the going to Oh, here, here, like so. D, here we have like the exact equations, okay. and we take d goes to infinity here to replace u zero by zero, uh, st equal one. And uh, we replace this expectation over R by expectation over oh, a Gaussian. So the, the, the symmetry is still is valid for any v, which is yeah, yeah. The, the approximating with this Gaussian is, is when v goes to infinity. Exactly. And this okay. zero initialization and the rescaling st equal to one. Um, so we get this bound. And uh, when we uh, like, uh, like merge the two, uh, like combine the two previous bounds, we guessed uh, this uh, error uh, when we approximate the SGD trained neural networks um, by the neural networks obtained by the dimension free uh, dynamics. And uh, I just mentioned again, K is independent of D and uh, P. And so in particular, uh, if this DFPD achieves uh, Tessera epsilon in time T, so uh, because it only depends on f star epsilon and rho a, so t will only depend on f star epsilon and rho a, then there exists a c uh, that only depends on k, t, and epsilon, so that for any d bigger than cp and number of samples bigger than cd and number of neurons big n bigger than c, uh, one pass sgd with step size uh, like it equal uh, t over n achieves uh, like a, a risk of order at some. Okay. So this motivates uh, like one important definition for the rest of the talk, which is uh, SGD learnability in OD scaling. This is like motivated by this. So what does it mean? It means that for any action, uh, there exists T star, C star, so that uh, for any uh, D, so ambient dimension, yes. Oh, number of samples. So a number of samples is uh, T over. Yeah. Like here it's one pass SGD and we're just counting the number of steps that we make. Uh, okay, so we, so for any epsilon there exists T star and C star so that for any D bigger than C star P, uh, number of samples N bigger than C star D and number of neuron uh, bigger than C star. So one pass SGD with step size like T star over N achieves epsilon risk. And so here again, like we can uh, replace by batch SGD as long as it's one pass. So, okay, so what's, uh, so what is this definition uh, saying? So it's a kind of a scaling law for learnability of uh, F star. Um, it means that uh, for any D uh, arbitrary large, uh, big O of D samples is sufficient to learn it. And so then like the caveats are, it's one pass SGD, but okay. So for example, if you take uh, the number of samples D at the power one plus epsilon, because you converges very quickly uh, to uh, zero, uh, you, uh, I mean, you will uh, only reuse like a few samples. So this is pretty mild. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we uh, have mean field uh, parameterization. So uh, depending on you, it's rather like, uh, the right thing to do or not. Okay, so here's the definition. The, yeah. Are you concerned about how, how large T star and C star are? Uh, so here they don't depend on D. So like here we only care about uh, the dependency in D. So, oh, so you're saying? Yeah, T star and C star are dimension independent. So yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, I'll I comment a bit more about this uh, in the next few slides. Okay. 
But basically, it's a scaling law, like d arbitrarily large. You can learn it with uh, a big old d uh, samples. Um, and so with this definition, we have like uh, the following uh, learnability certificates uh, for sparse function. So SR is SGD learnable in OD scaling if zero risk is dynamically reachable from uh, this uh, initialization in DFPD. And this is just because of this bound here. So like, uh, okay, we have this definition just, I mean, like it's equivalent to this, uh, uh, like DFPD being able to reach uh, zero risk from like um, first layer weights initialized to zero. Are there any questions? So where, where does the, the green come in? The, I mean, you had P bars. So this is P bars for any. The, uh, P, P is considered constant. Okay. Uh, P is considered constant here. So F star will depend on the, uh, P. So T star and C star will depend on P. Will depend on P. Yes. It will depend on P uh, through T star time T. So you're not. So I'm not tracking the dependency in, uh, in P. So. I mean, I comment more about this. Uh, but a bit then we're talking about constant sparsity then. Yeah, constant sparsity. But then we can do, you know, kernels also. So, oh, so, so, so missing something. Sorry. yeah, you need D to the P. In, in my result, you can do sufficiently slow. slow, oh, okay. slow so okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I, I, we can, okay, sure. Uh, so you want to do it linear in D as opposed to D? Uh, D at the power P, yes. Okay. So uh, that is the separation. Yeah. Nice um, so yeah, uh, Enric can allow for p uh, p growing. Okay. So here is just a clear if I fix p okay. bigger like yeah. That you could allow p constant Yeah. So so the the thing is like uh, we need d uh, like sufficiently large then. So like uh, p can grow like uh, slowly with respect to d. So I think uh, currently the 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 proof. Uh, that we have like allows for log log d uh, uh, figuring as log log d. Uh, oh, okay, I need to uh, go faster. Uh, okay, so just uh, uh, a numerical simulation. So we take uh, the degree four staircase. Uh, so d equal three hundred, n equal five hundred, uh, and so I compare batch SGD with uh, the DFPD solution. Uh, so the batch SGD is in a color continuous line and uh, DFPD is this dotted black line. And so on the left, I uh, plotted the tester, on the right, I plotted the uh, Fourier coefficients. And so you see that here, you uh, DFPD achieves like zero error. And uh, so in particular, it means that F star is SGD learnable in OD scaling here. And uh, for linear models, you would need D at the power of four uh, samples. And uh, features and random features and fixed features. Yeah. So here you have like again uh, from uh, linear ND to D at the power of four, which is non negligible. Um, okay. Uh, so can we understand which sparse F star is GG learnable in OD screening? And uh, so we'll introduce the merged staircase property. Uh, that would be a generalization of the vanilla staircase property. So we take F star, we decompose it into his, in his uh, Fourier coefficients, and uh, we denote Q, uh, all the non zero uh, Fourier coefficients. And we say that F star has the merge uh, staircase property uh, if we can write the elements of Q in order S1 to SR. And so that uh, for any J, uh, SJ add only at most one element to the um, support of the previous SIs. And so like here is for a few examples to uh, make it more concrete. So for example, for this first one, it's like the degree four state case. And so at each monomial, you only add one new coordinate to this support. Uh, same here, so you add like Z2, then Z3, then Z4, then Z5. Uh, here, uh, like Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 is containing this Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, like one degree monomials. Uh, examples of non MSP functions are those. So, for example, to go from Z1 to Z1, Z2, Z3, you add uh, two coordinates at the time. So, okay, they're non MSP. 
And uh, so we have this uh, simple proposition. So non-MSP target functions F star are not as reliable in all these scaling. And this has a very uh, simple reason is, uh, again, using the certificate. Uh, so DFPD doesn't reach zero risk. And, uh, and the reason here is because the weights UT during the DFPD dynamics obeys like U3, uh, U3 T equal U4 T equal zero. So basically, the uh, system is never fitted. And so you have uh, DFPD uh, trapped on the saddle point. And uh, here I remarked that, uh, okay, D bigger than exponential in T is necessary uh, because if you fix D uh, and uh, wait long enough, SGD will escape uh, this saddle point. And so here is a simulation with this particular function. And so like Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, you're supposed to map on it. And, after some time, you start running it. And uh, actually, for this function, we have a conjecture that it's SGD learnable in OD squared scaling. And so here, basically, it would correspond to weighting T proportional to D. And this is like more or less what's happening. Uh, so, what about the converse? So, when our MSP learned, so the advantage of this DFPD is that it's like really easy to. Uh, simulate. So here are a few examples. So the two upper examples seems to be learned and the two bottom uh, like wants them to be learned. And so what is happening for this two? So here you can see that uh, the target functions are uh, permutation symmetric in the first three coordinates. Uh, so it means that uh, u1 uh, will be equal to u2 equal u3 during the dynamics. Uh, so what happens when you break the symmetry and uh, you have this that happens, so you start learning uh, this function. And uh, actually, Enric will now... So it's not... Uh, oh, it's not. Sorry? Yeah, so when you put up the coefficients and not. you break the symmetry in this MSP, uh, like, uh, like the function is learned. But with, the the, with the symmetry, it's not learnable. I mean, no, just like this. And I think you can actually like show it. Um, okay, so actually, Eric will show that uh, non degenerate MSP are learnable, as you did earlier. Okay, uh, is my mic on? Okay. Hi, uh, so to recapitulate, we are trying to learn some function, target function of star. It depends on p inputs, and p should be thought of as constant as t goes to infinity. And Theo has described some dimension free PDE, which in the mean field a limit uh, describes the two layer uh, uh, tra training dynamics. And he's given a necessary condition that, that you must satisfy this merged staircase property to be learnable. And so now what I'm going to do in the last uh, 10 minutes is talk about sufficient conditions for learnability. And the first uh, thing, what we're I won't have too much time, but I'll give you a bit of a flavor for the proof. Is going to be to prove that if you have uh, you know some number of neurons that grows a little faster than a, a constant, and the number of samples that surround a D, you can learn uh, uh, this vanilla staircase. And in fact, you can learn this vanilla staircase for p sufficiently slow growing. Uh, but in particular, a kernel method would need d to the p samples, and the mean field dynamics kind of get around that. Uh, I get past that and allow you to learn it in uh, roughly D sample. And then the second theorem, which I'm not going to get into so much detail, is in fact uh, converse uh, in a smooth complexity setting to what Theo has said. And I'm going to prove that any function uh, which satisfies this MSP property and the coefficients are quote unquote non degenerate will be uh, actually learnable uh, in, this, uh, in this scale. And so uh, since the, the the dimension free PD is, is tough to analyze. Instead, we'll analyze this layer wise training, which uh, just means we're going to first uh, initialize the neural network. And for simplicity, we're also going to initialize the first layer of the neural network to zero, since uh, uh, it doesn't matter uh, and it simplifies this proof. Uh, and this, the second layer of the neural network will initialize to uniform minus one, one. And we're going to first train the la first layer for P steps. P is the uh, sparsity of the staircase. That's how that's you'd only need p steps. That's enough, constant number of steps. Uh, and these are the nonlinear dynamics that are tough to analyze. And what they're doing is they're creating 
new features so that when we train the second layer to convergence with some quadratic regularization, we do kernel ridge regression on a, a set of nonlinear features that we've learned by training the first layer. And, uh, and so the claim is that this layer wise training, uh, which isn't exactly what uh, the, the one pass SGD that uh, Theo was describing, uh, will learn uh, these, uh, these, uh, these staircase functions. So let's restate this first theorem. So it's saying, it says this, the vanilla staircase is learned by a two layer neural network trained with this layer wise gradient descent, uh, as long as you have deep the epsilon neurons and deep the one plus epsilon samples. And, uh, and, and so let's first let's, uh, see how, how could we analyze the generalization error? Well, so what happens when you train the second layer. Since this is a kernel ridge regression, we can apply standard bound um to bound the generalization error and particularly by adapting some standard kernel ridge regression generalization bounds we can prove that it suffices to show that after training the first layer the uh, it suffices to show that there's some certificate so some setting of the weights of the second layer that would be low norm and would also uh, end up with giving you low population risk and then in that case this kernel ridge regression uh, will also give you uh, Vanishing risk with high probability. And so this will be the remainder of the proof. We're going to show that there is such a certificate. And so now we're going to analyze what happens when you train the first layer. So because of the mean field limit, uh, let me skip over these, you can, uh, uh, you can prove that uh, the, when you train the first layer, you're going to converge to some limiting dynamics. And so essentially, for the, it'll suffice to analyze the following idealized training dynamics, where uh, we're just training the, fir the first layer and we're keeping the second layer A fixed. So for each neuron, we're evolving it in this way. And particularly this term depends only on the uh, limiting uh, distribution as the number of neurons and samples goes to infinity. And since it's always, uh, it's very small because we're uh, taking a relatively small but constant learning rate, we can essentially, uh, Ignore it. And so, for the purposes of this talk, we'll just analyze these training dynamics. So, just what happens? Let's try to see what happens when you train this. Well, another assumption we'll make, but which can be removed, is that uh, sigma is a polynomial. And so, time t, uh, the weights are all zero. And after one step, uh, the weights uh, have now picked up the coefficient in x1. In particular, this, you can see this by writing the update equation as an inner product between the staircase function that you're trying to learn and the uh, and xi. This is the update equation for the ice coefficient, uh, the coefficient of xi. And after two steps, now you can see that the the weight of uh, the the first uh, the, the coefficient of the first uh, uh, of x one is going to be a uh, some polynomial with a degree one term in the second layer weights and the coefficient of X2 will be a polynomial of degree two, second layer term. In particular, after uh, P steps of the string procedure, uh, in general, you can prove that the weights that you think are all given by polynomials in the second layer weights, which have this algebraic structure, okay? And uh, this allows you to then prove that the, uh, a matrix of uh, features that you construct as a training uh, is non-singular with high probability because this matrix is going to be a determinant in the second layer weights. So if you plug in the random uh, uh, weights of the second layer, uh, you're going to get some non-singular uh, non matrix, which can be inverted and give you the certificate that you need. And uh, so that's the proof sketch for uh, learning this vanilla staircase. Uh, uh, to prove that the non-degenerate merge staircase property suffices, a similar proof will work. Uh, we, well, the, the more uh, full statement of this theorem is that uh, given a, uh, a MSP function f, if you uh, perturb each of the coefficients by most some arbitrarily small constant tau, then you'll learn uh, with this layerwise gradient descent. And again, we use the same kind of uh, algebraic uh, techniques, although 
uh, slightly more sophisticated arguments are needed for this. And so overall, we have this meta theorem combining the necessity result that Peter presented and uh, this uh, theorem that I've just run over, which says that uh, with this number, total number of samples roughly D, uh, two layer mean field networks will learn a piece sparse function if and only if it satisfies this merged staircase property with these non degenerate Fourier coefficients. And uh, so just to summarize, uh, we've uh, explained that the staircase property plays some role in understanding what regular neural networks can learn. Uh, uh, Emmanuel presented a lower bound against kernel method. Uh, uh, Theo presented this dimension free PDE, uh, which uh, uh, allows one to simulate and determine whether a function will be uh, learned or not. And then uh, now I've quickly presented uh, uh, a converse to the necessary condition that he uh, presented. So that's uh, our talk. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's great. And can you clarify a bit? So what's the epsilon there and how, okay. the bottom line for your positive result, how many uh, neurons and how many, oh, yeah. how much data do you need? Is it right. Uh, Epsilon there is really just for convenience of, of, of stating this. Uh, we can we could probably prove this with uh, uh, where is this? Uh, okay, so uh, we take a number of neurons that's uh, just large enough constant essentially, and we take a, a oh, what's, sorry, number I mean, of samples. What, let's say, so it depends on p, p presumably. P. Every p is constant. So okay. The only thing that grows in this uh, setting is D, the okay. input dimension. So number of units is some, something that depends on P, but does not depend on D? Uh, yes, okay. it's a large enough point. Right. Okay. And then, yeah. And, it, and what's epsilon? Just uh, Epsilon is an arbitrarily small uh, constant. Okay. It just uh, hides log terms Okay. in, in D. Yeah. But what's the non-degenerate condition? Yeah, the non-degenerate condition is, uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, we have a, a function that satisfies this merged staircase property. We can write it as a multilinear polynomial. The non degenerate condition is that uh, if we perturb these uh, coefficients of the, these Fourier coefficients uh, randomly with some uh, any small constant uh, uh, noise, then we'll get a non degenerate uh, uh, function. Uh, what's a non degenerate function? Okay, so if we begin with f, f star, which is, is uh, some uh, uh, multilinear polynomial with a uh, sparsity pattern on its Fourier coefficients, which satisfies this merged staircase property, and we perturb the non zero uh, Fourier coefficients with uh, epsilon small noise, then we can prove that we can learn the resulting, the resulting function is, is learned. Is learned. So in some sense, it works. It works without probability with respect to the perturbation. So it's a smooth analysis. Saying any arbitrary uh, merged staircase property function that you begin with, if you perturb it uh, uh, slightly, you will get a function that is learnable. I think maybe we should again mention. Can you hear me actually? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a function like x1 plus x2 plus x3 and then plus the product of the three. Uh, it creates a difficulty for the neural nets to to learn because you know the three first monomials are competing, and so uh, it seems like uh, you know this this perfect symmetry uh, makes it that it takes a lot of time or doesn't manage to learn. Uh, if you on the, if, on the subspace, so the entry uh, check in the session, yeah, for the session. So you mentioned, so there, there's a, a positive result and it's not in a certain mean field setting. There's a number of units does not grow with it. It's, it's, it's in the mean, it's in the mean, well, it's, it's, it's in the mean field scaling. Uh, the number of units doesn't have to grow with the, the mean field scaling, correct? The number of units Because this is a piece sparse function. Uh, and I, I think that there might actually, in general, you might only need Constant? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, constant of, uh, yes. Large enough. That's independent. Okay. So, so uh, 
small n is the number of symbols. Oh, so capital, this is, capital N is just uh, bigger than a constant. Infinity is bigger than a constant. And then, <laughs> so, so uh, okay. So, for example, like so, there exists a constant large enough so that n bigger than this constant and degree to infinity which uh, absent. Right? No, I think I to get the approximation because you do have to get the infinity. Yeah, infinity so it will depend on it. Depend. Mm -hmm. It has to go to infinity, but independently. Yeah, exactly. So, I have a question which is related. Uh, so, the constant that uh, is dependent on the star, or so, so how this constant uh, depends on P? But so so it will depend on uh, yeah this star will depend on p so it will be like the time to convergence in this uh, dimension three or p yeah uh, so it will depend on p and maybe exponential in p yeah so so <laughs> but for this so, result yeah. then this is all the dot exponent of time to run uh, yeah. oh okay so yeah, for this result p Oh, you, yeah. Because it's heat that really acts. Yeah, it may take like double the exponential time. So, like for the positive result, we actually have like a bound, explicit bound in, uh, in P, which is uh, so uh, we need a, uh, yeah, like a D bigger than a double exponential. But I mean, it's not optimized. So, uh, P, right P. Uh, or like uh, yeah, everything has to be scale like uh, double exponential. Yeah, the number number of samples and the number. Of oh, yeah. yeah, but then we should. So, so for example, not for the first you don't need uh, D to scale. Oh yes, yeah. No, it's very yeah. 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 So so basically, the oh, second would be like uh, D is bigger than uh, uh, I mean number of samples bigger than D times exponential of exponential. Yeah. D. So. But you expect something like the so from the simulation. We like for two layer known network, we might expect like that exponential is the scale. For the in the previous paper with the much um, less uh, standard neural network, but so regular under our definition, we had uh, scaling. Uh, we, we could grow. We could run intense polynomial in NP. So we could handle. And, and, but this is also the. And we, there, the depth is growing with the depth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not clear that this double exponential is okay. Maybe it's not, it can be improved, but probably there is an exponential dependency if, if you are only two layers. I mean, to, to go back to your first question, Nati, if your P grows like log log D, this is still a case, a case where you have the polynomial scaling, uh, whereas for kernels, you will not be able to learn. So it does give a separation. Uh, and and now, if you still stick to just depth two, and in this midfield, it's not clear that uh, you don't have to pay uh, with an exponential scaling if you don't go with deeper models. Yeah. Okay. There are no further questions. Thanks uh, for the very interesting talk. The second talk for this morning, talking all by himself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. The second talk will be given by uh, Andrea, and I actually he'll tell us what it's about.